Patsy and her family thought and talked a lot about the Roosevelts, however. It was hard to avoid their presence in Hyde Park on the big occasions, like when the King and Queen of England came to visit, or on the day of Eleanor's funeral in November of 1962. That was the biggest funeral ever in Hyde Park. Then President Kennedy and his wife arrived at Hyde Park via Air Force One, joining former Presidents Truman and Eisenhower. The ceremony was featured in the weekly newsreel at the movies. She was not only the wife of the president, but a woman who had come to be, because of her own work, first lady of the world. So Patsy Costello now runs a and b in Hyde Park. Two nice and reasonable bedrooms, if you think you'd like to visit Hyde Park. Her house is filled with Rooseveltiania wherever you turn. Her living room and her dining room are piled high with books about the Roosevelts, photos and memorabilia about the Roosevelts, frames made out of wood, authentically recovered from the White House rafters. On the screened-in porch of the house, there is a shop where she sells Roosevelt objects she has made and found. There are cards with Eleanor Roosevelt sayings and pictures. There are memo pads with Scotties on them because of Fala, or even plaid neck warmers because of Fala. Uh, and several of Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt's grandchildren stay at Patsy's B and D B when they come to town. And she's also president of the Hyde Park Historical Society. And she also even nudges members of the Roosevelt family about dealing with some of the crumbling graves that need attending to in various cemeteries. So her life is pretty much consumed with this history. But she didn't, until recently, have any reason to take an interest in Lorena Hickok's role in her friend Eleanor Roosevelt's life. When, when Lorena Hickok died, five and a half years after Eleanor, in 1968, she asked, and remember that funeral for Eleanor in 62, she asked that she be cremated and there be no funeral. She requested that the Reverend Kidd, who had officiated at Eleanor's funeral, recite some Episcopal prayers, which he did, and that her ashes be dug in around some living tree so the tree could get the benefit of the chemicals. She got the first part of her request, but not the second. Her ashes sat on the shelf at the Dapson Funeral Home in Rhinebeck, New York, for 20 years, and were finally dumped into an unclaimed remains area of the cemetery. Hick might not have minded a whole lot. She knew her story was going to be told in another way, not through a tribute or a gravestone, but through the 3,363 letters she exchanged with Eleanor Roosevelt over a lifetime, which were now locked away in the Roosevelt Library to be closed until 10 years after her death. And that, and not words on a gravestone, would be her legacy. So on schedule, in 1978, 10 years after Hicks' death, a journalist named Doris Faber who had written in the past about presidential wives, happened upon the letters. She was shocked and dismayed. How can any reasonably perceptive adult deny that these were love letters, she asked rhetorically. In a state of emotional turmoil, Doris Faber pleaded with the Hyde Park librarians to put the letters away, at least for another several decades. Oh. Eleanor and Hicks' epistolary relationship is a rare and remarkable thing. The two poured out their longing in their letters. Oh, how I wanted to put my arms around you in reality instead of in spirit, Eleanor wrote Lorena Hickok during the first year of their relationship. I went and kissed your photograph instead, and tears were in my eyes. So ended one of the more of the thousands of letters that Eleanor Roosevelt exchanged with Lorena over the course of their relationship, starting when they fell in love in 1932 and ending not long before Eleanor's death 30 years later. In fact, uh, they, as I said before, they exchanged more than 3,000 letters, but actually more, they exchanged many more than these 3,300 letters, but Lorena, who was entrusted by Eleanor with both sides of the correspondence, destroyed some of the most explicit ones. Those that remain still tell the story of their love. There have been times, Lorena wrote from San Francisco after they vacationed together, 
when I've missed you so much that it has been like a physical pain. And at those times, I've hated San Francisco because you were not there. But the two also used the letters to tell the stories of their time. Hicks' journalistic training served her well as she reported on the terrible human cost of the Depression. She was good at gathering facts, good at getting people to talk, and good at vivid storytelling. I should mention by this time she was working for the New Deal for Harry Hopkins as an investigator out in the field about the conditions that people were living in and about poverty. Officially, as I say, Harry Hopkins, yeah, but she told Eleanor all the same things, and some extra ones as well, in her long and vivid letters. Hicks' letters and reports add urgency to Eleanor's advocacy for people in need. And sometimes they even made it to the president's desk. At other times, Hicks described situations so harrowing that they sent Eleanor to action. One of Hicks' reports about coal mining families in West Virginia impelled Eleanor to hop in her roadster by herself and drive down to sea for herself in these mines in, in West Virginia. And not long after that, Eleanor and others drew up plans for Arthurdale, a homestead community to house mining families. Arthurdale was one of the first of many homestead communities for destitute families built by the Roosevelt administration. It all started with a report from Hick. Doris Faber, the writer who discovered the letters, blamed Lorena Head Hickok for do donating the letters and allowing the world to see them. Hick, she felt, had been seduced in lonely old age by the library's archivist. <laughs> Hick had acted out of, quote, an uncontrollable craving for posthumous fame. <laughs> Finally, Doris Faber was pers persuaded that the story was going to come out in more sensational form if she didn't tell it. Faber's book, The Life of Lorena Hickok, ER's Friend, was published in 1980, and, and she was a very thorough researcher. Uh, she brought together some, she interviewed friends who are no longer living, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, but, uh, but the very mixed emotions with which she undertook the project muffled the story that deserves to be fully told and celebrated. Uh, and, but even in 1980, when the book came out, there were some, some outspoken lesbian women who yearned for more. And Joyce actually found me this terrific newspaper. It's the kind of thing Joyce comes up with called the Big Mama Rag, <laughs> uh, which was a lesbian broadside. And in this, uh, I love what this reviewer said about the book. They said that giving those letters to Doris Faber was a crime akin to turning over Sappho's poems to medieval Christian theologians. <laughs> suggesting that Eleanor Roosevelt might have been, had an intimate relationship with another woman. And one of these was uh, Helen Gahagan Douglas, you may know this name, a very progressive Democrat who spoke out against McCarthyism. She was accused by Richard Nixon of being pink right down to her underwear. And she refused, that would refuse to cooperate with Faber once she learned that there might be even a hint of intimacy between Hick and Eleanor. In 1980, homosexual aroused, homosexuality aroused fear and hostility, even in the woman who had championed migrant workers and African-American soldiers. So by the time I began reading the letters at Hyde Park six years ago, a great deal had changed. Love between, between two women no longer seems shocking or shameful to me or to most others. And this is where Patsy Costello comes back into the story. Because attitudes about homosexuality have changed so much in recent years uh, that the playwright was inspired to write a play about Hick. And a producer, this is maybe about well, 10 years ago, this play. There's another play now that's going to be going to maybe to Off-Broadway about Hick, about Lorena Hick. This is an earlier one. And the producer's name was Linda Kavar, and her production company was called Great Dames Productions. 
So they put on this play, and Patsy, because she was interested in all things Roosevelt, went to see it. And she got this idea from the play of what a smart and capable woman Hick had actually been as a top AP reporter first and as an investigator for Harry Hopkins. And she was shocked to learn the ashes, Hick's ashes, had been dumped into the unclaimed remains area at the Rhinebeck Cemetery. So she got together with Linda Cavars of Great Dames Production. And Linda's wife and some other people from the community, and also biographer of Eleanor Blanche Wiesencook. And they raised money for a memorial for him. In 1999, 31 years after she died, the little group of supporters gathered in a quiet and remote corner of the Rhinebeck Cemetery to place a brass plaque in the ground honoring Hick. It reads, Lorena Hickok, Hick, born March 1893, East Troy, Wisconsin, died May 1968, Hyde Park, New York. AP reporter, author, activist, and friend of ER. The group planted a dogwood tree to shade the plaque and installed a rough bluestone bench nearby. Hick finally had a memorial, 31 years after she died. Like everyone else I've talked to about this, my story in my book, Patsy Costello wonders about Eleanor and Hick's relationship. Was it a physical love relationship? And how physical? There's no way of knowing this. It is possible, as Eleanor's grandson, Curtis Roosevelt, has claimed, that his mother's, his grandmother's visceral dislike of physical contact <laughs> can confine the bodily expression of their love to kissing, cuddling, and tickling. It's also possible that Eleanor's wish to please allowed Hick, who had had lovers before, to lead her further into sensual pleasures. But there should be no reluctance to acknowledge that Eleanor and Hick were in love with each other, and that the intense period of their relationship suffused all the years of deep caring which followed. <clears throat> women who loved women surrounded both of them and showed the way to a freer life. For Eleanor Roosevelt especially, who was required to come out as a debutante and to marry within the narrow boundaries of class and wealth, the possibility of such love was liberating. When she found it with Hick, it enriched her life and Hick's forever. Thank you. is the Charles Wesley Professor in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Publishing at Emerson College. She is the author of Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, winner of the 2014 Pulitzer Prize in Biography, and The Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism, winner of the Frances Parkman Prize, the Mark Linton History Prize, and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. <coughs> Please join me in welcoming Megan Marshall, who's going to talk about, she always writes, some lessons learned from Joyce Andler as mentor, friend, and sister biographer. I guess the last word was left off. She's not really my sister, although I'd be happy if she were. Sister biographer, and I guess... Um, yeah, we've been talking about fellow biographers, but I, I prefer sister biographers to that. Um, well, I was sure that somebody else would mention this before I did, but clearly um, nothing better demonstrates the need for biographies of women, feminist biography, than the recent uh, debate among the Republican candidates in which they were asked to uh, name a historically important female American to put on the $10 bill rather than Alexander Hamilton, who I guess 
probably is not going to get an exit because he's so famous right now in a musical. But um, some of the answers, Mike Huckabee thought his wife should be on there, and Ben Carson thought his mother should be on there, Donald Trump his daughter, or Rosa Parks, uh, Jeb Bush, Margaret Thatcher, and uh, others thought Mother Teresa maybe. Um, what I particularly like, and I've been puzzling over this, is Carly Fiorina, who said she wouldn't change the bill at all. She'd keep Alexander Hamilton. So there's a, a woman candidate who knows that it's better not to be a woman candidate. <laughs> She'll win that way. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. I, I felt, um, you know, I've, I've, the other speakers before me have given very um, wonderful theoretical and substance-filled talks, but um, I want to speak for our long-standing women's biography group. Um, there's six of us in it. Sue Quinn, Judith Tick, me, Roberta Wallens, Fran Molino. You've heard these people introduced, and of course, Joyce Antler. Um, I started this group 30 years ago in 1985 when I had just signed a contract to um, for my first biography, The Peabody Sisters, which I thought might take me about three years to do, because I had written a book before and it took a year and a half, so this would be twice as hard, I thought, three years. And, and I knew it was gonna be a long slog either way. Um, I needed some company, and I knew Sue Quinn as a journalist. We were journalists together, and she was finishing her biography of Karen Horney. So it started the two of us and inviting others, and gradually, I think, uh, most of the six members now were together by, uh, you know, within five or ten years of that time. Um, I was always the youngest uh, by five to ten years, and I've never really had the chance to say to the others, and I'll say it to you, all of you here, how much this has meant to me to have the guidance and example of these women, my friends in biography, <coughs> and in life. Um, Early in my work on the Peabody Sisters, I started reading studies about sibling development. And there was one that particularly stuck in my mind about uh, IQ. And the claim was, obviously supported by lots of research, um, that an only child would have uh, um, the highest of all IQs because they're uh, they were hanging around with the adults, their parents, and they would get this intelligence from the parents. And sadly, you know, the next sibling down would, you know, it would be diluted and uh, on and on. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> the farther along you were, particularly if you were close in age, the IQ just went down. Um, unless maybe there was a big age gap. In fact, Joyce and I have this in common. We have two daughters who are seven years apart. And so, Theoretically, that youngest child is benefiting from having, in effect, three adults to be their parents. But anyway, I thought about this. Um, I really have, um, you know, benefited very much from these um, kind of maternal um, friends over the years. And if my writing has turned out to be good, if my IQ has improved, it's no <laughs> doubt because of the biographer's group. Um, another. Uh, theoretical component to my sense of how important this group has been uh, comes from Italian feminist theory, which some of you are probably familiar with, but I wasn't until I started reading these wonderful novels by Elena Ferrante, the four Neapolitan novels. I haven't read the last one yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Anyway, in reading about uh, Elena Ferrante, there was a wonderful uh, article about these books in the uh, journal N Plus One, last year uh, that pointed out that she had been um, either part of or very influenced by the Milan Women's Bookstore Collective of the 1970s, which, if you know about that, raise your hand. If you do, good, but not too many, so I can tell you about it. Um, this collective developed um, a, a theory or a sense of the practice of what they called entrustment, which 
probably with a different word in Italian, if anyone knows what the Italian word is. Entrustment, this is how it's translated. And the women of the collective, Luisa Moraro, Teresa de Loretis, and others, believed that it was impossible to learn what they needed to thrive as individuals from women of the generation before them, from their mothers, who had already accommodated to patriarchal society. This is back in the 70s. Instead, they advocated finding symbolic mothers, tying yourself, this is a quote from one of them, tying yourself to a person who can help you achieve something which you think you are capable of, but which you have not yet achieved. That's Moraro's words. Teresa de Loretis defined entrustment as a relationship in which one woman gives her trust or entrusts herself symbolically to another woman, who thus becomes her guide, mentor, or point of reference. In short, the figure of symbolic mediation between her and the world. So I have been lucky to have five and actually others because sometimes we had Lois Rudnick in this group, Phyllis Cole, and uh, Barbara Solomon briefly. So I've had at least seven or eight even um, symbolic mothers and relationships of entrustment from which to learn. Um, we talk in our sessions about our work, but also our lives, and I feel that these women have been, been going through life just ahead of me, so maybe I can learn from, from their wisdom or even possibly their mistakes. I don't know, did they ever make mistakes? <laughs> Not, never. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to give a few anecdotes, um, what I've learned really from Joyce in particular. Um, the first lesson was a lesson I didn't take in at the time, and this was my mistake. Uh, I remember early on, and, and this may be in her article in the Challenge of, of Feminist Biography, um, she had finished her biography of Lucy Sprague Mitchell, and she talked about, um, you know, maybe she just turned it in, in the next morning, because, you know, Joyce is never one to delay the next project. <laughs> uh, at the breakfast table, she said, said to her, to Lauren, and maybe uh, Rachel probably was just born, or I don't know. Um, she said, uh, you know, I'm thinking about what I'm going to write about next, and Lauren leapt up and said, you can't do that to us. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard Joyce say this, and I thought, wow, that's terrible. Uh, I had a little girl who was the age of Rachel, a baby, and I thought, gosh, I can't do that. I can't do this to, to uh, my daughters, have my project be so big a part of a family life that they'll be, you know, leaping out of their seats to, or eager to have it over. Um, and in a way, this is one reason I had started this biography group, was I thought, you know, I needed a place outside of my house to discuss this and to bring my worries and to, you know, and it was very successful that way. Um, so I did kind of, I think, artificially determine to leave my professional life, such as it was, it took me 20 years to write this book, um, out of the family scene in a way that I really have come to regret. And I have to say, one of the things I most admire about Joyce is the closeness she has with her daughters. Not that I don't have a closeness, but it's a everything in kind of closeness. And they're very much each other's uh, support and professional. They're just everywhere in each other's lives. And, and uh, uh, I wish I had heard in that anecdote uh, what I should have, that is, um, just keep going and keep talking about it. And they'll be part of it. So Joyce, she always writes, of course you get my joke, um, she's not uh, a you never call, you never write kind of person. Um, uh, of course she's the Jewish mother, so she wouldn't be. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of the things, um, that I think all of our group could testify to is that Joyce, um, I, I don't know whether she would reveal this to her peers on campus, but um, she's always got an enormous project that always seems a little bit beyond her control. And <laughs> in our group, she's often saying, I, I don't see how I can possibly do this. And it's due next week or next month or something. And um, she'll bring to us very gravely an early draft of something and we'll tell her mm -hmm, one thing or another and think that she's years and years away from finishing this thing. And then she goes away and, and it's done. Um, and this is a miracle, that's all I can say. Joyce is a miracle and she produces 
miracles, and uh, as with all miracles, they can't be explained. So uh, I didn't learn how to, how to do this miracle from Joyce. I just observed it. Um, if anyone, may, maybe your daughters know how she does it. They are a little closer, or Steve. But anyway, um, miracles can happen in the writing of biography, and Joyce knows how to do it. Another story that she told early on, and I don't, I just remember this very fuzzily, but it made a deep impression. Um, Joyce had been um, at a meeting of women in her temple, um, a small group, I guess, and, and one of them had suffered some setback, or don't even remember now what it was, some deep sorrow. And Joyce told how, I think spontaneously, these women uh, contrived a kind of ritual to gather around this woman, shelter her. Maybe they all had their coats on. I don't know. Joyce could tell it better than, than I could. But, um, but this was uh, a way of telling this woman that she was going to be protected by this friendship and um, that they would always be there for her and, and that she had shelter with, with these close friends. And um, I don't know who this person was or what was, what was going on, but the story struck me so much and also hearing it within my biographer's group with my five friends or whichever ones were there, I kind of have always thought that our biographer's group functions that way for each of us as we come with our various problems, some of them about our work, some of them of other natures. And I just feel very glad to learn through Joyce and through the others in my group about about ways that they've helped other women, and certainly they've helped me. So I just want to end with one last story. Um, Sue, I think it was, brought um, some of us into this uh, community of uh, summer uh, sister writers and artists, um, I, uh, uh, the Duxbury Group, um, which has been going for maybe more than 30 years. I don't know. Um, she, it began with a writer's group that Sue was part of and decided to rent a um, summer home, and sort of in the off-season, I guess May, and 